And I'd like to just spend a few minutes now explaining how it is that we got to the conclusions that we did when we speak about the fact that peak oil is upon us. Uh, and I will try and explain what we mean by peak oil because it is a widely misunderstood phrase. So if we go back to the beginning, over the whole of the 20th century, the developed industrial economies grew on the back of plentiful oil, plentiful, easy to access oil. And our history is built on a presumption that there's an awful lot of it, it's pretty easy to get hold of, and the prices are pretty low. And for pretty much all of the 20th century, that was the case. And a lot of our oil came from really very low capital intensive installations that were pulling oil out of the ground at a very small price per barrel. And what that has meant over the whole of the 20th century is that as we've needed more and more oil, we've been able to access more and more oil. And the growth in our oil requirement, the growth in demand, and therefore of supply, to have been matched so far, has been like this, which is shown on the curve between 1920 and more or less the present time. And you can see within that curve a couple of important points. First off, the growth is pretty dramatic in terms of what we were using in 1930 and 1940. There's very little comparison between that and what we're using now. Secondly, and this is an important point for later on, the split between what we might call the developed economies of the OECD and the developing economies of the non-OECD. And since about 1980, nearly all of the growth has come from that second family of countries. But up until just short of where we are now, supply has managed to keep pace with demand, and it hasn't been that, that, that difficult to make it happen. And so if we look at the price of oil from 1920 to around about now, you can see that in real terms it has changed quite a lot. But if we rebase the price to $2,008, the gold line, uh, then you can see that actually it's been pretty stable. And for most of the time since 1920, oil has been less than $30 a barrel. Indeed, even in the 1990s and running up to 2000, it was less than $30 a barrel. There are only two cases where it hasn't been like that. Uh, the shocks of the 70s, 80s period, which were pretty dramatic, as you can see from that curve, and brought about a pretty hefty realignment of people's appreciation of the importance of oil at that time. And now. And the question is, is now another spike? or is now the beginning of a trend which just carries on going upwards? That's a really important question because our economies are so geared to the use of oil. So the question is, where do we go from here? We spent some time looking at that and in order, in order to make some assessment of where we go from here, uh, we really have to have a picture of where we are now. Uh, and this diagram which is in our report shows roughly where we are now. At the top left hand side you see that big box that represents the reserves that are in the ground. And it's very important at this point now to make the point about the definition of peak oil, because we're not saying that there isn't a lot of oil left in the ground. There may be a huge amount of oil left in the ground. Some think that that is the case. We're not saying it isn't. What we are saying is that there's a limit to the rate at which we can extract it. And we've been extracting it at a peak level just a few years ago at about 85 million barrels per day. <coughs> And our contention is that it's going to be very difficult to get much above that. In fact, we don't think we're going to get much beyond 92 million barrels per day, and it's pretty unlikely we're going to get much above 100 million barrels a day. So it's very important to think where are we going next, because if we're going in that direction, there may be some serious shortages. So this is where the oil is at the moment, and there's a huge amount of it in the big box that I said, which is oil in the ground, no dispute about that. And there are variations, there are revisions to what's left in the ground, known as reserve growth. And we're also discovering more oil as we go along. And those inputs are shown on the left-hand side. They feed through into the market on the right-hand side in the proportions that you can see from the diagram. And at a glance, therefore, OPEC is hugely important, as you can see, as a producer of oil to the world markets. But so are other areas, FSU, non-OPEC and the Canadian oil sands, which are huge <coughs> So you can see all of those feeding into the big picture. Where do we think that's going to take us next? 
Well, our view is it's going to level out. You can see the grey area just at the end of the curve now projecting forward to about 2015. In other words, the lifetime of the incoming government. We think this curve is now going to turn over and run horizontal. And we can be fairly confident about that. Unlike predicting how much unfound oil is in the ground, we can be fairly confident about saying how much is going to come out in the next five years because we know what projects there are, we know what rates they're extracting at, and we have some idea of the age of the field. So we can make a reasonably confident estimate of what's likely to come out in the next five years, and that's what leads us to our conclusion that we may have some trouble because there simply aren't enough big projects in the pipeline to allow us to pump faster. So a number just in excess of 90 million barrels a day looks possible, and we can see it levelling off at that number as is shown in this graph. Well, that's not very far out five years in the scheme of things. Where do we think it's going next? And here is the contentious issue, because it's very difficult to see it actually going anywhere uh, north of that top dotted line. The top dotted line, the horizontal plateau, is more or less the case that was made by Shell in our report last year. So that's an industry inside view. Their view, as expressed then, was that we're not going to go sliding down the slope, but we'll probably maintain a plateau. And that was the view expressed essentially by Tony Haywood last week when he was talking about BP's view of the world. <coughs> our view isn't quite as bullish as that. It is that we think we will begin to slide down the slope, uh, but of course one can argue about that. But the real issue is where is demand going to go? Supply is somewhat academic if you can't find, uh, uh, if you can't meet demand. The other point is, yes, there may be lots of oil left in the ground, but an awful lot of it that we know about at the moment is in rather inaccessible and inhospitable places. So we may be able to get it out of the ground, but it isn't quite like the nodding donkey in the backyard that I started with. It's not cheap, easily accessible oil. It is oil that's in inhospitable places and is expensive to extract. So even if we can extract more oil from fields to be developed in the Arctic and in the Gulf and off South America and places like that, it will be extracted at a much higher price than it was historically. So even that says prices are going to go up. But let me just return finally to the demand question. Difficult to get away from this one. We can see the rate at which the non-OECD countries are developing and if we just track the growth rates of countries like the BRICS and compare them with the G7, for example, you have a rough correlation there between the OECDs and the non-OECDs. And you can see from that graph that the very muted growth of the OECDs plus the awareness of a load of issues concerned with hydrocarbon fuels lends credence to the view that perhaps the OECD's demand has peaked and will level off. It doesn't lend any credence to the view that the non-OEC demand has peaked. That's going to go on going up, as is pretty obvious from this graph, unless something dramatic happens. That means if we go back to this graph now, we have our supply side on the right-hand side, which I spoke about a few moments ago, will probably come somewhere in that shady area. But if you just take 1% growth for the global economy, mostly coming from the non-OECD countries, then that dotted line that goes right there upwards is the one that represents the demand side. And if you follow our report and do some very simple calculations which don't seem unreasonable, you can easily predict that line of growth. So if that sort of growth takes place in the next 20 or 30 years, our best projections of what can be delivered fall woefully short of that, and it's very difficult to come to any other conclusion than the fact that there will be a structural deficiency in terms of supply when compared with demand, and as a consequence of that, price must go up. It's going to come from more expensive places, and we won't be able to pump it fast enough. There may be loads of it there, but there's going to be a price issue almost certainly. So finally, let's come back from these global issues and just think about the UK. Where does that leave us? Well, that might leave us with the prospect of prices of oil which are structurally higher. They go up and they stay up, maybe $150 a barrel, maybe more. That's a pretty unpleasant thought. But in terms of the incoming government and our national economy, there's a second hit, and that is that we have been self-sufficient, essentially, in oil for the last 30 years. We've been pulling oil out of the North Sea, but our own North Sea oil has peaked. We're slipping down the, the, the descent side of the curve now, and in fact, just recently, we have once again become a net importer of oil. So in terms of our UK economy, we now have turned around from being an exporter to an importer, and the price is going up at the same time. That sounds like a bad combination.